Good evening. Welcome to the public meeting on the hazardous mitigation plan and the update of the municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. Um, I'm Carolyn Ness, a member of the select board, and this is Kimberly from um, FERCOG and Chris, our MVP um, consultant. And they will talk about the plans, but I just wanted to um, say thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we have a five-year hazardous mitigation plan that we're updating. It expired July 2nd. The purpose of, of the meeting tonight is to have um, a public uh, discussion on our, our draft action steps. And then on the municipal vulnerability preparedness plan, we would like to update it um, and make sure we're inclusive of any new problems that people have as we're updating it but um, it's my intention that we add the tanks to the sewer treatment plant to our plan for resilience. Uh, we're gonna increase the height of, of the tank uh, um, sides down there so they'll be less susceptible to flooding. Um, we don't know um, if we'll be adding it to the round four grant cycle, which will probably be out in another week or two, um, but we're hoping to um, uh, submit a hazardous mitigation grant for um, the north end of town. And that's the purpose of pushing forward and and beating on poor Kimberly to get our plan done so we can get it submitted. So <laughs> I'm going to turn over the meeting to Chris um, Curtis, who lives in town and has also been our consultant, and um, he can give us a little background on the municipal vulnerability plan. Well, thanks, Carolyn. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> Appreciate your being here. Um, really the purpose of this meeting is to kind of hear from you, so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to give you some background on um, what we've been working on just in case you're not um, up to speed on, on this. Um, so the state has a municipal vulnerability preparedness program uh, it's, uh, sponsored by the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs and um, it basically provides support for communities to um, plan for community for climate change uh, resilience, and it offers two kinds of grants. There are planning grants that give uh, communities the chance to put together a MVP plan and basically uh, a climate resilience strategy. Um, and then there are action grants that allow communities to take steps to implement those ideas and strategies that come out of their plan. And um, it's really one of the best deals in the state at this point because the action grants, um, there's a, only a 25% match required from the community. So you can get some pretty sizable and important projects done uh, and have it funded 75% by the state. And so um, we have taken advantage of those programs in Deerfield and we got in 2017, we got a planning grant uh, we completed the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Plan with a, uh, we had a core group that was established to oversee the process that included a lot of um, town officials, um, town administrators, select board, police and fire chiefs, um, EMD, uh, DPW, Conservation Commission, et cetera, are on that group. And really what came out of that was um, we looked at the vulnerabilities in town and, and the key thing that most everyone seems very focused on is, uh, is flooding. There are obviously other climate related impacts on Deerfield, um, including things like, you know, winter storms and uh, tropical storms and um, tornadoes and hurricanes and so forth. But flooding was really um, kind of the key, the key focus. So we, we developed a series of, of action strategies um, that came out of that plan and were um, subsequently the plan was adopted and voted um, by the select board um, and then formally approved by the state. So Deerfield is actually the, the first certified MVP community in Massachusetts. And I think that helped us in the, um, the following grants. We applied for a second grant, um, an action grant in 2018, and we got um, funded for a $66,000, $67,000 project. And that included um, getting funds for engineering for the Mill Village Road culvert, which is the one that's been collapsed for a number of years, and for um, updating the town's floodplain zoning. 
Um, then following on that, um, this year, in 2019, we got a third um, MVP action grant, and that was for a project totaling $389,000. Um, so altogether, you know, close to half a million dollars in, in projects over the, over the three years of the program. And that um, grant was for um, engineering and design for the Kelleher Drive culvert replacement, construction for the Mill Village Road culvert, um, engineering plans for doing some green infrastructure in the cent center of town here. Uh, we're doing uh, tree box filters and rain gardens in the um, town center and at the two schools uh, to try to uh, better manage stormwater um, in these areas and reduce flooding. We're doing um, public education on the town's new rave alert system to try to get more people engaged with that. Uh, we're working with the schools up in the old Deerfield area, especially, and, and others to do um, a, an evacuation plan um, in the event of a uh, Great River Hydro-related emergency or other flood emergency that might happen there. And we're also doing a land conservation strategy working with the Franklin Land Trust for the Deerfield River floodplain to try to protect that, that floodplain um, as an important resource for the town. So that grant we just got, um, and we're just getting started. That, that work is, um, is just barely underway at this point, and will run through June 30th of, of next year. So that's you know, a little bit of background on what's happened so far. Um, this is a program that's moving pretty fast, so we're um, anticipating the release of the fourth RFP for action grants um, coming up any day now, really. And we'd like to again apply and see what we can, whether we can take advantage of this program again. So we want to, you know, think about um, what projects might be the highest priority um, issues for town. We have a, a kind of a laundry list so far that was generated by our, our core group, the group that I mentioned before. But we'd like to hear from you all um, on a couple of questions. Really, uh, I guess the two main ones are. Where are, in your view, the, the most important um, flooding or climate-related problems or vulnerabilities that Deerfield is faced with um, currently? You know, and anything that maybe isn't something we've already got in the plan or haven't, you know, thought about to this point. We'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And what ideas do you have to make the town of Deerfield more climate resilient? You know, you've heard a little bit about the ones that we've worked on so far, and I'll give you kind of the quick rundown of the laundry list that we have so far and the kind of thinking process for, for this next round, but would love to get your, your input and thoughts um, beyond that. So, um, and Carolyn, please feel free to jump in here on any of these that, that you, you want to. Um, so for the next round, um, obviously we're, we're doing the design for Kelleher Drive right now for the culvert replacement. We're thinking we'd like to apply for construction money for that, but it may be too large of a project for this program. We're, we're, we're going to have to see what the RFP says when it comes out. So that's one possibility. Um, another one is doing um, the construction for those two, a, the couple of green infrastructure projects that I mentioned that we're designing also this, this round. Uh, so the rain gardens and the tree box filters, we'd like to actually you know, put those into place. Um, the town would like to get a second emergency mat me message board, um, so that's a possibility. Um, there is the possibility of looking at putting in one or more water flow monitoring stations on the Deerfield River to give the town more timely and better information about the possibility of floods so we have a little bit more data and advance warning. So we could talk about that a little bit. Um, there's the issue of flood mitigation on the Green River, which is a tributary to the Deerfield. Um, and we, we might talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, I mentioned the land conservation plan that we're doing for the floodplain. We'd like to take that the next step and do some implementation with that. 
Um, so that would involve outreach directly to landowners to see whether or not there's interest in the um, sale of their um, either an agricultural preservation restriction or a conservation restriction on properties and try to get some there, there is money available for you know those kinds of things in, in, in this grant program so again working with Franklin Land Trust on that would be a possibility um, and I think oh I guess um, following up on the I didn't I guess I just didn't mention this one in the in the third round, we're also doing a, um, a climate resiliency day here in Deerfield sometime during the winter months. That will be uh, kind of a workshop with speakers and opportunities for people to learn about climate change and climate resiliency. And I think it's an, out, it's an outreach and education effort to try to get community me members more engaged and involved in this issue and, you know, explain to folks what they can do themselves to try to help address the problem and I think we might want to follow on with follow on that issue with some further work more outreach maybe work with high school students for example to try to get them engaged in this issue um, we've been working on Deerfield 2030 and the idea is, is there's not a lot happening on the federal level so we really need to take responsibility on the local level for initiatives and so the idea is to come up with Deerfield 2030 is what we as a community can do to reduce our carbon footprint and be more resilient um, and financially stable because um, climate change has really a lot of negative impact on us as a community. I mean, you have more diseases, uh, you know, we have more ticks, we have more mosquitoes, we have more flooding, we have more frequent intense events, we have more heat, we have more drought. We've, you know, I mean, it's just, in, everything is intensified. And so um, there, we, our culverts need to be upgraded. Um, as um, Chris was talking about, I, um, we, we have to strategize on how much money is in this next round because there isn't a dedicated um, revenue stream for this program yet. It's, it's definitely a favorite of the governor. He is, he is definitely supportive of this. Um, and he wants people to use it. So since we're one of the, you know, star kids here on uh, communities in the state, we want to make sure we're always having something um, ready to go. Um, but Kelleher Drive might be too big to put on as the, you know, in the next round. So we might need to do the small bridge program for that. Um, because it's well over a million dollars. And, and, it depends on how much money um, the governor releases. The, the round three that we had, I forget what it was, but it was substantially more money on round three, and I think it was the end of the year money, because we had to sign the contracts before June 30th. So um, I think it was the end of the year money, so we had a bigger pot of money than round two. And I think he just finds leftover money at this point um, uh, because the legislature hasn't voted a, a, they are there's a bill that hasn't gone through um, the legislature yet completely but there is a bill going through that will um, give it a dedicated revenue stream but if it's a priority for the town there's nothing that precludes us from taking a lower match oh yes yes project. yes it, it's just that they might not fund it at all and and oh. and we don't have, you know, just based on my experience, I think it's going to be well over a million dollars. But the we don't other, have the final answer. I think yet. the other issue is that the culvert, you know, it's not a culvert replacement program. So the more we keep loading culverts into it, while it really is a main need for the town and it really drives what our resiliency is um, and the hazards that we have, if they just see you're changing culverts all the time, they're probably just not going to help yeah. us. So it's strategically kind of filling in those those things and one thing i wanted to talk about and i'm sure it's on the list but it's it's bloody brook and you know i know we're doing um our you know we're trying to get up and running our our mosquito district so that we can get in and clean and all that stuff but why uh i think we should pressure this into the program where we start you know i know the cost of doing all this stuff is permitting so why not 
ask for that cost to get in here, start digging out these culverts and under under all the, the under trees. the mosquito district. We we have the ability to do that. Well, let's roll the two together. Well, we uh, thankfully we just hired starting October fifteenth is our supervisor, Good. and so um, our superintendent of our mosquito district, and he's really really um, enthusiastic good he's young mm -hmm. he's you know but he's worked a couple of years at the uh, central mosquito district so he has plenty of experience already working in the field and the idea is that he can work with our highway department and yeah, i think um, and i think it's yeah. going to be more than our highway department can handle so i think that you know a, a little bit the highway goes in and does this little so i'm talking let's get this stuff flowing or at least study how, where our backup is because i know the backup is a waitley Right, it's five and ten. It's that area. Well, there's a beaver. There's it, a beaver dam. Yeah, all really. that stuff. I think we should really look at, you know, I know Kelleher Drive is a disaster, but it's still, you know, it, that's letting the water through. It's just the problem is, is all that gets backed up from right over here, and I'm not sure where it goes into Waitley, but from there, those wetlands and right back through the school and all the way up Main Street. I mean, we talk about this all the time, and we look at the flooding and the pictures, and <laughs> it, uh, every uh, customers come on. 40. We should really study that. Like, I mean, we're studying the Wapping Road area. Let's study this and figure out where is that backup? How much would it take? I know when they raised the tracks when the trains came through, that also limited it, kind of made a higher dam for the water to go through, if I remember right. You These know, are little um, tidbits and stuff I've been told. Trevor, that's a, uh, you know, I think we could, don't you think, Chris, that legitimately we could get some engineering out of that? Or at least... Yeah, I think we have to really define very clearly what the problem is and why oh, it's an important issue to the pictures. town. So are you saying, when I, Trevor, that it backs up in a certain specific oh, area of town? Oh, I mean, the, the one thing yeah. that people complain about is their, their basement's getting flooded and their whole yard's getting flooded, their car's getting flooded, just parked in their driveways all along North Main Street. Right. So, and I have tons of photos of it, you know, all right. the culverts are really undersized going pe through people's driveways. And, you know, it starts up at the north end of town, um, Actually, kind of by Sokolowski's and even a little past that. It's kind of wetland there. Yeah. Uh, even where the Dollar General is going, that's kind of the head, head of it. And then it kind of works down through. Oh, great, you've got some maps. And I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm. Can you finish your description? I think that it would be helpful. Let's look. Yeah. 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 And so... You do. I mean, I, the first thing I did was put in more another sump pump. Right. Well, uh, uh, in December of last year to get through the winter. To be right. It's constantly. Um, people I, I, up at the other end are having much bigger. Oh, it's bad. And I think that's I like the problems. one thing maybe yeah. if we could study that, like what did the railroad impact do when it came through? Because I think that when they beefed up that for the high speed trains, I think they raised the level of that and it created a limit for how much water will, and so it backs it up a little further. And then it's been, I mean, I remember going to high school here, people, you know, we'd hang out in the back there, but the trees have filled in all of that. The I culverts, know. you know, I think it'd take a good effort if we study like the backup, why, and how much could we actually, how many cubic feet could we get rid of if we actually did this? I, I don't think it would take that much more engineering because mm. we're having Ty and Bond do the engineering for um, Kelleher Drive, so right. they so part of that just like Mill Village, they have to study what uh, what the water backup is or you know potential yep. to flow through because you have they it have it goes to right up it goes up enough. over the road of Kelleher. I mean I, I I've been stood there you know you're you're up to your ankles and it's going right over. That's Kelleher. why the Kelleher is falling. It's apart. yeah it's falling apart and so it yeah, is and I think is. somewhere I don't know. Roger's been here a lot longer, but that somewhere it goes over there, and I think it's wetland, or I, I just don't know if we'd ever have any ability to flush it out of town. I mean, you got to watch, you can't just dump it on Waitley's problem, but I just I wonder where that goes and where it starts, and can it flow any faster, or is, are we at the limit? And, and people just need to understand that or change their topography of the well, yard or. The whole point of doing, I mean, the reason why I put the effort into the Mosquito District is because it is bureaucracy, it unbelievably is. bureaucracy, but it does allow you to go in and clean the ditches, mm -hmm. which haven't been done in town since the early 80s, and that, maybe we um, could and that's part of it. Meld so, the two. But maybe um, it's worth trying to put in some kind of engineering 
to, to have have a, a, a professional overview just of it study versus how much you could instead get rid of just going in cleaning out the ditches. Right. I mean, you could clean yeah. out the ditches, but if you're never going to, like if downstream is just never going to take any more water. Yeah. Do you, you, yeah, I'm going to take do, a look. And do you know, does Waitley have a problem with Bloody Brook? Um, I think they do. You know, it goes, does it go across to in front of Gateway? Well, there's that big, yeah. It goes. It goes, obviously, the Conway Road crossing where the trains are. Yep. And then it goes across 5 and 10 between uh, the end of, God, I can't even think of the street, Conway Road and, uh, okay. you know, I can't think of the development there, that little. Oh, uh, Elm Circle. Elm Circle, yes. Okay. And then it goes out their White Birch Campgrounds. Oh, so it does, okay. It goes out that way and then it dumps into the Mill River. Yeah. But Trevor. The railroad, by increasing the height of that, really didn't dam up anymore. Oh, it didn't? Okay. I wouldn't say so because it's the culverts. It's what you said about debris and yep. the ditches themselves. Oh, but you can clean news. all these ditches up in our community, and once it hit, like, say, Whiteley, and those ditches were still plugged up or full, yes, the silt will carry, will, yep. the moving water will carry that silt, but eventually it'll still back up and... Right. start filling in those ditches again. Yep. So the water could move to the Mill River and then it would go to the Deer, uh, Connecticut River. Yep. But, well, and the reason why I asked the question about Waitley is because they are going to be doing the MVP planning process. Oh, become maybe they could group it in and see. So it may be that you have a conversation with, with Waitley and see if they might be right. interested in um, doing a joint project. Right. Um, because the MVP program does like to see these joint regional kind of, kind of stuff. Scale. And theirs might be just out in the middle of nowhere where the beaver dam is so Roger. Well, Roger? there's beaver ponds, you know, I, there was one at one time just like in that Elm Circle area by the word White Birch Campgrounds. Okay. But the Bloody Brook dumps into the Mill River, and the Mill okay. River is creating a problem for Whiteley's water supply. Uh, it was eroding the bank and stuff like that. Oh. So that, But you're right, sort of where their Mill River is, it's sort of out in, and I don't know it that well by yep. any means. There's probably right. some areas that have problems, but it's more rural. It's yep. not like downtown North Main Street. Right. So, you know, but land uses have changed over the years. Everybody used to utilize every piece of property they have, yeah. and they kept those ditches clean, and that's some of the problem up by you know, the drainage area on by Richardson's and yes. Bittersweet. Yes, yes, yep. and it's all silted in. If, if I yeah. could just ch jump in for a quick sure. second here. Um, we, when we were doing the last round uh, of work, we went out, uh, Kevin Scarborough, uh, Zach Chorniak from Ty and Bond, and I went out and looked at the North Main Street flooding at the time when it was really flooding badly. Yeah. And the conclusion mm -hmm. of, of our engineer was that the Kelleher Drive um, culvert was the primary source for that North Main Street backup, not stuff downstream, but, wow. but that culvert itself. And then the, se the secondary problem is that there are a whole series of culverts on Bloody Brook upstream from Kelleher Drive. They're fairly small. Really small, yep. and they're usually usually just for driveways. Yes. And they've been installed, some of them more recently, and they're they're not sized properly. Right. So we actually were investigating whether or not we could get MVP money to replace those culverts because right. I think that's re what's really causing the, the flooding of the okay. basements along North Main Street. And um, it's been difficult to get a clear answer from the MVP folks about that issue of, of you know, can we pay for stuff on private property? I, I think right. it's, the general answer was no. Um, so hmm. we, could, we could look at it again and, and right. see whether or not we can make a case for that. But I guess the key point here is that, you know, the preliminary assessment from the engineers is that the problem is, is really focused on, you know, that area right along North Main Street, not so much yes. downstream. From right, the, and I was thinking, uh, I didn't know if downstream kind of backed it up, but if you're saying yeah. the, Col the Kelleher is doing it, I thought that was a fairly large one, and I don't know how big it is under North Main. Um, yeah, it's... And, it's, it's, a, it's not sized okay. appropriately, and it's got some problems with it. It wasn't wasn't built well in the first I place, see. so yep. it's kind of, you know, it's starting kind of a, to right on the degrade. corner. It's kind of weird that, right. and then not then. And right these other upstream culverts are on private property, yes, or are they private property? 
they're on, they're on private property and were probably installed as part of driveway installations right along um, Bloody mm -hmm. Brook on North Main Street there. There's a whole series of them. Um, Maybe people, there's an in incentive we can help with, relic, can you know, with yeah. people's property. Push them off to the tower. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there are a there are way a distance in on private they property, but there isn't, there's like maybe three or four of them. That's all right. that there exists. And right. they've been in there for years. Years. Yep. Yeah. And they so haven't maybe been touched. There'd be an incentive, or maybe they're interested, you know, they can't get out of their house multiple times. It's flooded. Maybe they're interested in looking at that. Yeah. I, I, I think actually it would, I, I think I would want to write in. Um, I mean, we can talk about it in the steering committee, but it does make sense to have somebody engineering wise look at it, and then we could tie it in with Waitley. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pretend that, you know, or not pretend. No, see if they're interested. I mean, yeah. and just see if, if it is that backup. If it's not, yeah. if it's this, then fine. We, we still we do our space. We on an overall system look at. Yeah. And then we just could look at that watershed. For the waiver on, as a private property. But it does back up once you get past Bloody Brook. Uh, right out here, it backs up and yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's a good point, and I um, and and I and I wanted to make sure that we got the Wapping Road area, Roger, and five and ten. Well, that's why I'm sort yeah. of here because it, and I'm sure there's a, this flooding affects a lot of people, but it affects us. So that's why I'm here to ask how it's going to tie into trying to clean up that area. Well, um, one of the reasons tonight we have to have um, we're updating our or renewing. Our hazardous mitigation plan. It's a five-year plan, and um, this, this Kimberly is our consultant from um, the FERCOG that is doing that. Um, I can't believe it's been already five years. This was a nightmare plan five years ago, but this is the third hazardous mitigation plan that I've been involved in, and we're trying to make it be um, actually relevant instead yeah. of just doing it and set it, setting it on the shelf. No, it needs to be um, a working document. This is a really, truly good document this time, and we're in a, trying to integrate it with our MVP program. Kimberly and Chris have been working together, so this is really happening. And we did do engineering um, because the idea was to apply, uh, you know, we wanted to, to uh, th that whole area that floods, this, this is from the landslide of 2011, November 2011. We had super saturated soils, if people remember that was a horrible year. We had blizzards and all kinds of stuff in January and February. Then we had a really wet spring. But we had um, uh, Irene happen in August. Did you August. have a flood before that? Yes, but, but there was August, August was Irene and we, and we had significant rainfall. Then we had a wet fall. We had Snowtober. Remember, we I canceled Halloween, and boy, my phone was wild <laughs> with that. Um, what because about we racing had, Wapping Road? I mean, what? I drove down it the other day to take Caleb to a soccer thing, and um, what, like when we do this work, does it make sense to raise that road a foot or so? I mean, because it seems like that would bear. No. Well, I don't know. Make a barrier between the hillside well, and the property. Well, you're going to flood out other people. Like you can't restrict no, the I mean, flow like of the on, water on that side, like between the hills. So the soil. So what happened is we had this landslide in November of 2011, right after Snowtober. It was super saturated soil. The silt came down through the railroad culvert. Fortunately, we we were aware of it. And, and we kept the railroad um, culvert open. It, the railroad was very good. They had a work crew out there every um, three or four hours at, for a week, more than a week at a time. It was unbelievable. But this, so we had silt come down, not the whole railroad um, bed that it would have been horrible um, um, if it completely plugged and then the pressure pushed everything down the hill. But it was the silt came down and it came across Wapping Road and filled in that whole area between 5 and 10 and Wapping Road, and then um, plugged up 5 and 10. The state came and cleaned out those culverts, so it moved the silt over um, to the area between um, 5 and 10 and Mill Village. So we have been trying to peck at this on a little bit of a basis um, and try to um, keep the water flowing. But unfortunately, all those homes on Wapping Road and the businesses on 5 and 10 have um, really been 
uh, the water table is up every time it rains even an inch now the whole road f uh, flow um, comes over the road and the septic systems are in failure my and question is is it backing up from the other side of five and ten or is it too much water coming off the mountain and not managing it it's really a combination of both but because um, the water does come off five and ten but there's nowhere for the water to go it sits and eventually does move out towards the river, but um, it, it's very slow. And so you can't do dredging. So we're not doing dredging. We're doing alternative water management. And basically, you're cleaning it out, and, and so the water will flow. And we're reclaiming farmland that is now wet and icky um, across from 5 and 10. There's about 15 acres there. So. Part of the process would be to clean out that area and make the water flow with a, with a new culvert going in mm -hmm. and the engineering done, we, we feel that we can move the water and that's prior to the landslide. To get it to the deer We're field. still, you know, there's no way, it's a multi, multi-million dollar, like 10 plus million dollar fix to go in and drive stuff down on the banks. Um, so there's going to be continual silt coming down um, when we have these intense rain events. Well, you can't I, stabilize that with ground cover? I'm no, not familiar where the landslide took place. It's, but. Um, it's Gwanter's, you know, at the edge of Gwanter's hay field, and it's all trees. And the trees are standing up. They're not tipped over. But um, I, I, I'm very familiar with that area and yeah. the monoclay that comes down into the Wapping Road area. It's got to be some type of ditch getting formed yeah. or a ravine or something. That, and it seems like you divert the water or whatever or try to well, stabilize that. Um, we of. had the state geologists come, Steve, um, and, and then also we've had NRF, NRCS out there multiple times to see if they had an engineering solution. Well, and I was thinking if you, like, that's why I asked raising the road because you, then you create a bigger ditch on the hillside side and you dig that out a little bit more and you can... But it just silts catch. in, Trevor. It if will you just constantly... If you don't have that water moving, and when Irene came through, the farmers, you know, corrected their problems on that side of the road. Yeah. And those, as long as they maintain that and don't let brush or a branch get it caught in and make a dam, that yep. water will keep moving and carry that silt right to the river. Okay. And obviously it's going to create maybe problems someplace, but it's not going to be right there. Right. But that's what happened. People don't, that makes sense these little the places cover. where they pastured cows before aren't getting utilized and right. it's not just a concern, so they just let them fill in with brush. I physically went out and did a bunch of that stuff to try mm -hmm. to help. Yeah. And when is the state going to come back out and dig the end of those culverts? Because it helped immensely when they did that. They created a settling pond like for the silt to flow into. Once they fill up, the culverts gets blocked and Scoop then just it just backs out. all the way up. Yeah, yeah. Roger, we call it in every time, uh, and we on purpose call it in to the 24-7 DOT desk. And they are supposed to come out. So you can't contact somebody from District 2 or whatever and meet with them and say, hey, listen, there's brush growing up in those things I've right. seen. They know you know, about it. They it know needs about to be it. done. It's not a big big to-do. It's not going to solve the problem, but right. it helps. Right. Each, you take it out and leave room for more silt to come later on. But I like the ground cover idea, too, because I don't know. I would think there would be some way. It could be expensive. It's sort of similar to what happened up at the Green River by the cemetery they had an issue. It actually, oh, it's yeah. almost the same. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's Where that basically. whole road was sliding down? Yeah. What did they end up doing there? Did that? They, did they, they stabilized that they with did trees stabilize. and stuff. Yeah. Okay. And there's trees growing on this bank now. Well, I know, but there's going to be an area, Carol, Carol, and there's so much silt that comes down. It's been going on for 20 years. Ben Savage and I came in when the town office was over at the old National Produce Bank in they were going to try to look at it, but nothing ever got done. Hmm. Well, I, so it's, I mean, it seems like those are our two biggest issues: is this road, you know, North Main, mm -hmm. and then Wapping. It Wapping. is. It is. It's, Other than that, we're we're pretty good, unless you know we have a hundred-year flood with a dam falling out sometime. Well, I'm the, not, the, I'm not the other, just um, like Chris was saying, I just saw something on TV, and it was the 38 flood, and we talked a little bit about it about zoning and stuff like where Fishers, the old fire station, that was flooded. 
oh. at that time, and they were going down it with canoes and stuff. Really? And that's Blacksmith's Brook, and that is the same issue. There's got to be something too. down in between, you know, South Main Street. Right. And that's what's affecting his sellers and people oh, yeah, not yeah, keeping yeah. that ditch it's clean. The town used street. to clean it. It's a different yeah. flow. Yeah. So, yeah. so one of the um, recommendations in the current hazard mitigation plan that we're working to update was um, cleaning the ditch system. And do we need... Which is new. I mean, we're putting it in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but do we need to have some engineering or um, some professional analysis of the system and where it would make sense to do what kind of cleaning? I, I, well, I was trying to get it done through NRCS so it wouldn't cost us anything and just you know have them come out and do it. But they are so understaffed right. statewide that um, maybe putting in, I mean, the worst can happen is that we won't get funded. But I, I think it's one of those things that I think, I think it's very attractive to actually have maybe Zach or somebody, somebody be able to give us an overview mm -hmm. of it. Because I was thinking if, um, if it was written as an MVP request for the, des the, the design and the you know, evaluation, the hydraulic evaluation, mm -hmm. then once you have that, because the FEMA hazard mitigation money won't pay for the design and permitting, so you would have that information that then you could apply for a hazard mitigation. Right. The other, the other um, one I was hoping to get some engineering for is um, <clears throat> we, we as a select board just on our last meeting um, have two spots on River Road um, that are collapsing and you know we're having an engineer come out and look at them. Um, but what it is is, is excessive water is causing, but why? And so um, there's two, you know, both of those spots are Where are the probably, spots, Carolyn? Well, right, actually, one is right across the street from Dick Kalashevsky's house. And then the other one And then the other one is by the, uh, just before you get to the boathouse. It has um, the Eagle Brook Road that goes up, I think, or is a road that goes up? Yeah, just oh, before the Deerfield Academy boathouse. Yeah, I know. Oh. I see cones and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so we need to find and figure out some um, way to deal with the excessive water because it is water related. It's just, why is it washing out? You so know, is, it, is it our design? What's changed? What, I mean, to me, it, it's a kind of analysis of, of where, what, you, what, what is the water and, and why is it changed? And why is it all of a sudden? Because these were all of a sudden things. Mm -hmm. No, the, the, you know, the one maybe up by the boathouse is, right. but the one across from Dick's, 60 years ago, when I was a kid, that was an issue. So that hasn't changed. So and then, then why I'm is gonna, the design, then the design is not proper? For well, they, I was just going to say, they worked on that like five years ago, right. maybe. Yes, we, that was part the, of the, part of the um, a million dollar mass works project. That and at did. that time, they were saying the water backs up and the water would get into that bank. And then when the water receded, it would pull the fines out oh. and then it would drop. And somehow there was, and I don't know how far into the riverbank they got, but they used to dump concrete, all kinds of stuff in there to try to stabilize that bank. That went on for before I was born, probably. Wow. So then what we have to do is figure out, we do have to figure out a design that will keep that road from... But it was pretty stable till just this past spring or something. Yeah, I don't know if it just was settling where they put rock or something so like that. But it used but to that, be a lot but, worse. But Roger, then what, I mean, that's the point of, of hiring somebody to come and advise us on what that is. I, know it I mean, we can't be putting a million bucks into no, that No, I understand that, turn, Carolyn. Turn but, you know, sometimes when you put stone in, it doesn't get, like, uh, filter fabric, so the, the silt will work down into that stone, and maybe that's what created that small sag along the edge of the road. I'm, I'm not an engineer, I just from experience. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, maybe you won't have any more issues there. Maybe it was just a, a little settling that went on. I don't know. But the, the other one, I don't, I'm not that familiar with it. I don't know what caused that. If the water from the roads uh, 
-hmm. I know in front of my house, the roads need to be, it comes down, the roads get, the dirt gets built up, and I tried to clean it out, and I did when I first built, and now it's high enough, and it keeps running down the road into my driveway, creating problems with mm -hmm. the edge of the roads need to be, and the water put where it's supposed to go, not where it just jumps off and creates an issue. That could be the problem up by the boathouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, a lot came off that old road, and then, um, I don't know if the guy was just putting brush or whatever, but it came right around the corner and went, I think it just saturated underneath the road, and then the whole thing just slipped. So one thing I just want to note is that for the hazard mitigation plan maps, we put areas of localized flooding. Mm -hmm. So if people could just mark on the maps. Can we mark on here? Oh, yeah. You oh, can write okay. on the maps like, so. Roger, would you? Well, we know where um, those spots are. Yeah. Do you, Trevor, you know where that spot is by the boat house, right? And then you were talking about River Road. Well, yeah. the, Carolyn mentioned it, and mm -hmm. that spot has always been a problem since, you know, I've been a little boy, and I think it was before that. The town used to dump snow there and stuff, and I don't, I don't know, you know, it just was always a, an issue in yeah. that one spot forever. So one, one thought I had, um, and this goes back to what Trevor was saying about, oh, we just, the town may want to reconsider just always can, um, submitting applications for, for culvert projects. Would it make sense to think about um, a project that would request engineering um, evaluation for kind of larger drainage areas? So if we could look at the map and pinpoint where these problem areas are and figure out what the the drainage area is or the, or the watershed on a you know, somewhat larger scale. So the approach would be, okay, the town, we have these chronic problems here. We want to get away from just looking at this specific culvert. We want to understand why these things are happening in this watershed and then we can prioritize, okay, we need to know, you know first we do this, Next we do that, next we do this. So your, I think, and Chris, you can chime in about this, you know, it, that might be a more um, interesting MVP project because you are acknowledging that while you have site-specific problems, really those, the problems are related to the larger system. system. Right. I absolutely agree because I, I want to make sure that we, we look at that field where the landslide originated mm -hmm. and then all the way down. And that was the purpose of um, hiring, you know, because Zach had to do a certain amount of, from Ty and Bond, had to do a certain amount of engineering mm -hmm. for the design of the culvert at Mill Village. Right. So we had him do some design work up mm -hmm. and so he could look at the load, water load that needed to be moved down. So it would make total sense if we had, you know, a, an approach from, I mean, that was why I wanted to make sure we had this hazard mitigation plan ready for this month's um, hazard mitigation grant opportunity, mm -hmm. because I feel like it's very competitive. There's huge reasons to take care of. You have all those houses that potentially have some septic system failures mm -hmm. and that would be valueless if you can't flush the toilet. Right. You have businesses that have constant business interruption every time we have a little rainstorm. Well, and you're going to be, if you're going for the FEMA money, money, you will be more competitive if you have a larger project area that you're working in right. because they have you do a benefit cost analysis. So the more infrastructure um, impacts you can quantify as part of that project, the the better off you're going to be. Well, and, and I, I know um, we can, it's a, it's a major east, I mean north-south mm -hmm. evacuation route, yep. emergency vehicle response, so every time that's shut down, that has serious impact. Yeah. And Deerfield Academy is more than willing to write um, impact letters, um, Bement, Eagle Brook, mm -hmm. the nonprofits, they can all write letters of support, which they have in the past for, yep. um, you know, this, stuff. So I, I think it's very doable. 
um, and I think it could be successful. It's just, um, I like the idea that it would be most more inclusive because then you have a true solution. Mm -hmm. well, Kimberly's right when she talked about getting somebody to tie like that culvert on Mill Village in because if that's not placed at the right elevation, it's going to goof everything up upstream if it's not sized right. And it's the same thing with the Kelleher culvert and that whole drainage area. But it's like I was speaking to somebody that lived on North Hillside and it impacts, it's just a small culvert, maybe impacts his house, maybe another house. But all the ditches are just full and they just, if you just take the debris out of them, if That's the water That's on North Hillside, run, Roger? What's that? That's North Hillside? Yeah, it's right do you, by... Uh, do you know where... Um, I don't know the number, but you know where Skip's... Uh, oh, Skip Sobieski's new house. Yes, yeah, so the house that's right yeah. on his, by his driveway to the... Okay. Upstream side of the road. Um, yeah, I can And the town, up. he said he, they dug it out and stuff, but I said, it's really the ditch that needs to be cleaned to the railroad. And then if the railroad isn't maintaining their ditches, then, you know, it impacts everybody else, too. Well, they, they did a lot of work on that crossing, and that, that didn't help, because that... Um, but the crossing, it, it's really where the culverts go across, Carolyn. You know, that crossing, yeah. they could have raised it, like Trevor was saying. They could raise the bed up, but it's... If they didn't restrict the flow of that culvert, you know, it shouldn't have impacted. But it's just they need to be clean, and it's expensive to do it. And the permitting is an obstacle now, a big obstacle. Carol, I had a question. Um, you've also hired Ty and Vaughn to do some, in addition to the work on Mill Village Road culvert, which we funded under MVP, you hired Ty and Vaughn separately to do some further some, hydraulic right. evaluation. Is that work done yes. now? Yes. Um, um, well, we haven't paid for it completely, but... No, um, that part is done. The, only the calculation part is done, but the application part isn't done yet. Correct. They haven't... We, we hired them to do the hazardous mitigation application because it has a cost-benefit analysis that you have to fill out. And so um, he, he was supposed to do that, but mm -hmm. we held off because we don't have our hazard mitigation um, plan submitted yet and and you have to have a a, a you know current hazard mitigation plan and ours is expired but I'm hoping that Sarah White from NEMA will support us and write they wrote and they have us as an asterisk rather than having us drop from the list it's an asterisk that we're on the list still, but with an asterisk, so that we mean it means that they we're renewing it. And I'm, I will call her tomorrow morning and say, "Well, we had our public meeting, and you know we're hoping to get this done fairly soon, so that we can apply for the grant in a couple weeks." And so hopefully she'll support that. So could could we take a look at the hydraulic evaluation mm -hmm. that you got? Because I haven't seen that. Okay, um, um, we can ask Zach to. To forward it to us, or has he forwarded it to us, Diana? I'll double check. I, I don't. It's been a while since he completed it, so I can't recall exactly. He did it because we did, were gonna. He did get some documents. He was gonna. We were gonna do it for August, um, but we didn't submit because we did, we had an expired plan, and I and, and that was too optimistic. This this is we're we're getting towards the end. And so I've been beating on Kimberly to get this done so that we can apply. Yeah. But um, so what do we? What does the town or the community have to do to qualify to get money from this grant? Is there? We have to. We have to have a current hazardous mitigation plan. Um, and what happened last time, as you know, Roger, we went through the whole process, even calculated. I had to pull out my old economic books for calculation of the economic benefit, um, cost analysis benefit um, work, and because uh, I hadn't done it for so long. But we had gotten $800,000 to um, do restoration work along Little Meadow Road next to our sewer treatment plant. Um, but by the time our hazardous mitigation plan got um, renewed, um, we had we didn't have enough time to do the construction but work. Like Put I, it out like to bid in construction, so we had to give the money back. And that's why I was nervous about submitting something, getting the money, and then not being able to spend it again. But like when Chris was saying they're going to build some 
tree filters or storm? Mm -hmm. Is that tree boxes? Tree boxes is that part of the thing to qualify? You need to do this if you get this kind of money. You need to do such and such. No. No. Okay, I was just wondering what springs were attached. If there was any. No, we're just trying to move water. Um, make okay, but so a lot of times yeah. you have to do certain things to qualify for the money. So for the for the FEMA money. No. No. Um, you just for, have to have the current plan. Right for the okay. MVP grant program, they do like to see what they call nature-based solutions, which is what Chris was describing. And, well, I'm sure like, that would... Yeah. Like the Leary lot, like the Leary lot, we want to put pavers in that would filtrate the water instead of just asphalting over everything. Well, I understand you know that. that, but a lot of times when you get that hard, mm. con you know, it turns to concrete, the gravel, and then when you get the road grime on it, it's like waterproof and it sheds I, just I, like blacktop, so... Roger, I, I, steps, I, under, but. I understand, but I, I did go to a, a wonderful workshop on um, uh, pervious pavers, and they really are much more technologically, technology um, advanced than they were just a few years ago. People, a lot of communities um, to meet their MSS, MS4. Well, I didn't know if that was part of it, if you had yeah. to do stuff like that, but you've got to be realistic and realize. No, as you know, we did the stormwater um, uh, plan, uh, management um, zoning so and for the planning board and um, as a result we we got off the list for the MS4 requirements so that really saved saved our, us quite a bit um, and I and again I appreciate you doing that you worked really hard you came to a lot of meetings we got we got that um, you know, uh, implemented in town and voted in a town meeting, and we haven't had any problems since from the you know state coming in. So, it, if you look at Northampton, that it's been hugely expensive for everybody, and it's been a nightmare for them. So, it was I, I'm very appreciative of all the work you did on that committee. So, the previous papers that you were just mentioning, um, is that something that you might want to try to? as part of an MVP grant? Well, um, what, yes, because we were working down a town in the complete streets. One of the things that we've wanted over the years is do the Leary lot. Where, where is that? Um, right next to the Greenfield Savings Bank. It's a town-owned parking area. We've had several designs over the years from the 80s, then back a little later. You know, the idea is to clean up downtown a bit fix the crosswalks on the common and put regular benches in. Um, you know, just update that a bit, but we need to coordinate that with the crosswalks. And back in the 80s, uh, Steve Upton's business group had looked at doing Leary Lot and kind of tying that in with some parking and park-like to the common and closing off Park Street. And there was a lot of just different ideas, but mm -hmm. we have to think about a little bit about Leary Lot because we like to put our snow there in the winter. We also want to encourage pedestrian traffic out to Elm Street. And if we beautify that, um, people who own the buildings on Elm Street talked about, well, if, you know, if this becomes a lot nicer here, maybe we'll clean up the back side of our buildings and put retail on the back side of that. And then you'd have pedestrian walkway suits. It's a little bit bigger, bigger plan. I don't know how it fits into vulnerability. Well, I think, sure it, it, again, it fits in pretty well with the green infrastructure work that we're already doing in the town center where we're doing, you know, stuff to well, keep the stormwater on site. And I need not to see that because I want, I'm curious, you know, I, I heard about that and I just want to make sure what we're doing is not going to get changed in a year when we do the complete street. Diana, do you have I just, that? I just comment? want to make sure it's coordinated, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to put boxes in and dig them up in a, in a year when we redo the streets. So. Right. right. Well, Kevin's working on that. We're not talking about downtown. Those are going to be at the schools, right? Isn't those within no, the no. We're no. talking about the Leary lot right now. Well, no, I know, but he, she, but she's talking about the tree stuff. Yeah, We've got to make the, sure we're on the same There's day eight day. tree box filters that would go in right in the town center on the two cross streets. Okay. So... Yeah, I don't know how so, we got to talk about that and make sure that we even want to do that because we've got to have the sidewalks done. We're doing a whole complete streets program, and, and the, there's a lot going Who's on. Who's the there. consultant that's working with you on that? Ty Bond. Yeah. But okay. the whole, you know, 
mass DOT and they owning the roads and there's a lot. According to them, we they don't we don't they they don't own the land. When I they called and complained, roads. no, I called and complained about Sugarloaf um, not even two weeks ago, and the DOT guy says that's not their road, and I said that it absolutely is their road. Of course, it's their road. And then so he called called the foreman on duty and he said, oh, no, it's not our road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think they understand. So you need to get, get in touch with their lawyer. I know, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying that. But at any way, I, I really want to get that stuff fixed, but I'm worried I don't want to even put these tree boxes, which I think is a great idea, but after we do, right. you know, I wanted to or beautify at Elm the same Street time. at the same time and have it look, you know, presentable yeah. and, new, you know, I'd love to see tree boxes and planters and, Better lights, Port, better Portsmouth, crosswalks. Portsmouth, New Hampshire is where um, I went to the seminar and, and they cleaned up their um, water, their downtown water. They were on, under MS4 um, requirements. So it wasn't that they did it, um, you know, just freely. But um, it, it, amazingly, it is beautified. People were so excited because it beautified the downtown, but it also... Um, took care of their stormwater, and, yeah, and it it very, and it really was right. And they had filled up, they had filled up dishes all over town, and the stagnant water, and it mm -hmm. smelled, and it was mosquito breeding area, and I mean, it's not dissimilar. Um, it was more complicated than ours, but very similar kind of problems, and they they took care of it Isn't with impervious paver, pavers and. Um, tree boxes mm -hmm. and all kinds of green infrastructure. It was, it was a massive job. They got um, at least 50% um, grant funding for it and, it, and it came out beautiful. I was so impressed. It'll be interesting to tie in the school stuff, you know, but uh, downtown I worry about going too far with that. But, right. You know, that was my concern. I had already said that we yeah. just need to make sure we coordinated with complete streets. I just want... You know, it's one of those situations where we hopefully we could, we're going to have, you know, some application. So we, you know, could make sure that this works together. So who knows the time frame for the complete streets work best? So we are, we're in the tier two planning, uh, prioritization planning process. Um, and we have, um, we're coming up with that sort of final plan. We'll be having that available for the public probably within a couple weeks. Um, once that's done, um, that gets submitted to DOT and then approved, and then we expect Carolyn was hopeful we'd get in October. But there's two funding cycles in the in the fall and the spring, so we're hopeful that we could get into the spring funding cycle. We actually in FY20 do have a small amount of money for design mm -hmm. in anticipation of being able to get into that April funding round. So uh, if for construction, for construction, oh. right? If you know, if all the stars were to align and the plan gets in on time and is approved then according to DOT would be eligible for that round. So if you've got it on the spring. The construction could happen next summer? Uh, I think the time, yeah, the timing is pretty quick on the, on the complete yeah. street stuff. I think and we're trying, trying to decide that over the next couple months, um, you know, if we're going to need some funding, we'll, we'll have to think about that for the budgeting, you know, season over the winter here, yeah. kind of lining up for that work. I've been waiting years to get something done on that common just benches and better crosswalks. But the problem is the crosswalks go to, or the sidewalks go to no crosswalk. crosswalk the crosswalks are not ADA compliant. We need to just make sure whatever we're gonna do, <coughs> it all gets coordinated correctly. And I just, so many moving parts, and I have not, I've not had anybody be able to tell me how the process works to get it done right. And so we're not wasting money and putting in tree boxes that are then gonna move. And, Here's one thing to, to know about this, this next round of MVP, I, I went to a workshop for it, and basically they, they're looking for projects that are done by June 30th of 2020, but they're willing to extend the contract a full year beyond that for certain projects that are, can be justified. So if you're looking at a summer potential construction schedules, actually might work out pretty well, so that you get the tree box filter money mm -hmm. synced up with the right. streets money you only have to do Love things that. up once. Then I wouldn't feel so bad that we're not so many for the fall. Right. I mean, I, I'm very disappointed we're not 
submitting for the fall. This is just this a lot round. of planning. Yeah. I know, but I feel like we should put something in. But, I mean, you, you know you're not going to get anything if you don't submit anything. So, but if you throw it out there, you then a plan, though. I know. But if you throw it out there, then you find out what what they don't like about it at a minimum, you know, or, or how they feel about it. Because they feel, because you want to have conversation with them and then you improve your application for the spring. So, I, you know, maybe coordinating, a, starting the coordination process for this fall would be okay. Then. Yeah. I think Diana is going to work on getting a meeting together with District 2, District two and Kevin and me and we're just going to hammer out where the crosswalk is going to be so I could start that planning and ask for the money and then okay. tie it in with the tree stuff. I mean, I'd love that to would be unify. perfect. That would be perfect. I want to do from the railroad. So when you set it up, when you set it up, you can ask them about cleaning out um, five and ten by um, Bittersweet Bakery as well because that that is one thing. And then we need we'll to submit also submit a list and I'll, yeah, I'll ask and them we need to them. make sure that they have us is Sugarloaf is their street and not our street. We need to get clarification on that. Yeah, yes. for sure. It's in the log, and um, well, I, I didn't give the guy, the guy was just a dispatcher, I so yeah. I didn't give him a hard time, but I said, I just want you to know that I know that this is not true. <laughs> um, so I'll offer that I have a grant right now to do um, a stormwater, sustainable stormwater management plan for Franklin County, it's like a high level analysis of opportunities um, to leverage existing programs to do these green infrastructure Great. types of stormwater Great. management. So one of the ideas I had was using the Complete Streets uh, program, even though it's not specifically right. you know, designed for this, but I think that there are still opportunities. So I, I would like to um, attend the meeting I'd just to, to sit in yeah. and kind of hear what you're doing. Do you and think that you would be able to coordinate? I mean, the, the grant would be allow you to coordinate between the two programs? Well, what I have in my grant right now is um, for each of the different kind of modules, I select a pilot community. So Deerfield could be my pilot community and so okay. I mean we can talk about yeah. about this more but I, I think it's it. a great opportunity to combine the MVP work right. the complete streets work yeah, and help we can and just coordinate yeah because I, yeah. I think that's what that's what we're missing mm -hmm. is is someone to oversee the coordination well and and maybe I mean I'm I'm just thinking that you know if I go to the meeting and we yeah you have some background Right, we can talk about that and yeah. we can see what the, the needs are too. And also sometimes it's just helpful to have the person who's kind of hovering at the higher level right. watching what other That'd people are doing. That. that would be fantastic. Um, We'd really, so. We would want to volunteer for that. Okay, great. That's and, okay with you, Chris? Okay. Sure. Yeah, and I think that okay. we could probably, you know, ideally we would find even more opportunities Right, right for this green infrastructure work to happen. Well, one of the, one of the things we were thinking about is that Frontier, of course, Frontier is, you know, separate from us. It's not the Deerfield Elementary um, parking lot. But if we were going to put in, you know, the charging stations, the electric star charging stations, it made sense to do, you know, when they do the parking lot over to do um, pervious pavers, mm -hmm. but then also do the solar. Over, you know, the so, you know, uh, the raised solar canopy, canopy yep. um, as well. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's it, Deerfield participates, so obviously you have to have more coordination, and it's more complicated because it's a frontier district. But I can't imagine that anyone would be against it if you had, um, you know, the, the you know. We we pay fifty percent of the bill, so whatever the match was, if you're if you're generating some wonderful thing like that, then it can't be that bad. So how would you pay for that? The, the, this is at Frontier, right? Right. And, and the parking lot. Well, we'd we apply for you know some kind of energy grant kind of thing because we had 
because we have we, our energy committee is interested in putting charging stations in. Yeah. And one of the spots was at um, it was Lori Busada. Yeah. Um, putting charging stations in at Frontier. My green communities might be something. And so uh, that's what we were thinking of is that ultimately you could get green communities to pay for the canopies at least. And then pervious pavement, maybe they could come under some other thing. But it, the cost, or we could look for the difference in the cost from regular asphalt to just, because that area is one of the areas that always floods. So this would be a wonderful opportunity to have some kind of filtration device underneath put in. Mm -hmm. yeah, the pervious pavers could probably come out of MVP. And, and that could be, and that could be, if Waitley isn't going to be an MVP, then that's, um, and Conway is an MVP already. Mm -hmm. So I, do you know if Sunderland is at all interested? Um, we're doing Sunderland's right now. Oh, so yeah. all, th all four of us, we could do um, a joint um, MVP for all four of us then. Okay. Yeah. So that could be a potential new project. So, so the Frontier piece? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because when you're doing stuff at Frontier, then uh, that would all, the all of us yeah. count right. for all of us. And right. if Waitley gets theirs done and Sunderland gets theirs done, Conway's is already done. So we, we could jointly do it. Um, so are you thinking that would go into this next round that we're talking about? Potentially. Potentially, because this would be the time frame that... They're talking, it wouldn't be this this um, school year, but it would be during the summer of next summer. Yeah. So if, if we could get, if, you know, the planning process could be completed. Do you think you're going to have the planning process completed for Waitley? It has to be, um, Sunderland and Waitley have to be done by June 30th, 2020. So if, if we got an extension for them to put the parking lot in, in like July or August. Are you talking papers for the whole parking lot? Yeah, because they're going to do the parking lot over again. No, they're not going to do papers in that. But if it was covered under the MVP program, wouldn't they? Way too much money. Way too much money. I could see pathways and walkways and stuff like that, but they'll never pay that. do papers in that whole thing. Plowing, all that stuff, you're going to rip those to pieces? No, the, the new technology, they, they plow wonderfully. It's going to be like four times the cost. And if that's you, if you, if you, if you just, get it... I'm just setting expectation. That's never if you happen. If you get it covered by the grant, it, that's... It, and it's not, for, down, it's, not for, it's not four times anymore. Oh, uh, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, no, they've improved... Trevor's Bring up a good point. If you have to contribute X amount and it's only going to last two years, you're like throwing that money out Roger, the window. Roger, I have spent a whole day talking about pavers. The technology has come leaps and bounds from the original pavers, but and they are they are more expensive. Scale like that? I mean, not, I'm thinking. Go to like go to Sportsmith, New Hampshire. They did the whole community up the there. Whole road? The parking, giant parking places with them. Oh, how long has it been in place? Um, I think it's five or six years. Well, and that's the, a long I mean, time. To me, I did test for I'll, I'll look to look. I'm just blown away that you do a full parking lot in papers. And the, another option, too, and maybe you could do a combination, is the porous asphalt, which, you know, they have the porous asphalt down at the Waitley Park and Ride. Um, they, oh, yeah. And um, it's really interesting if you stop by during a rainstorm, yep. you can tell which, which, is which. which is which. Like the parking lot at Circle K versus the, the drop-off area? Yeah, just huh. within that area. So, I mean, I, well, I think that the technology has come a long way. It has, done a it's lot absolutely. Because um, my concern was when even just doing the Leary lot, you don't want to have problems pay, you know, plowing snow in the mm -hmm. winter. And, but, and you don't want to have to have maintenance issues. But I think, I don't know how big the parking lot is that you're talking about, but it's, let's say it's a couple acres or an yeah, acre. Yeah, yeah. So it might be that the engineers would look at that and use a combination, like you were saying, pervious pavers and walkways and yeah. overflow parking, and then, you know, of course, right. asphalt and other areas. Where the heavy traffic might be, that yeah. would be paved, of course. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. 
Yeah, where you did, could have you tree box that? filters. You when could do all kinds of um, there. I think I did three years ago. It's uh, you know every March I have to go up to um, New Hampshire. We have the All New England yeah. meeting for the conservation districts, and um, they had they did a lid, which is your um, alternative um, drainage systems, and they Portsmouth. Um, did millions of dollars worth of work in their community to comply with MS4 regulations. Um, they were under EPA, you know. I mean, they had they had to do it because they were dumping too much unfiltered water into the ocean and all kinds of stuff. But um, I, I was really impressed, be, and I asked a lot of questions about snow plowing and maintenance, and um, and they had it. Uh, and they had a lot of ice, because that was what I was, you know, climate change, you're getting more ice than snow. And, um, and, and apparently, they haven't had any issues. And that it was already installed for like two or three years. You know, they've already been through like two or three winters when I went. So. But I was very interested because it's so it, it was so attractive. You know, we have so much asphalt down here, yeah. and and you you end up being able to do the paving area, but you don't. It doesn't come across as the awful black asphalt in the summer that generates so much heat. Um, but it, you know, it was in busy areas. It wasn't um, like in areas that were not used. And the frontier. Parking lot to me is, I mean, it's used 181 days a year or whatever, but it's not, it doesn't get, it's not like the four way stop down here or something like that. Okay. Um, so, so, just a little side conversation we're having here, just so you're, you're, you're tuned into this. So, my understanding is that we can't do a regional application that includes Sunderland Waitley because at the time the application goes in, They're they won't certified. be designated and certified. But Conway is certified. Yes. So I'm going to reach out to Conway just to see whether or not they might potentially be interested in signing on to a Deerfield application, which would make it you know, maybe a bit more competitive. Um, um, you know, the other thing that um, Kimberly and I had talked about before is doing a regional MVP program because uh, some other communities like Ashfield and different ones are get, trying to go through the certification process, but Conway is already done so that we, you know, the South River area, um, we, what we want to do is pursue, um, you know, uh, access to floodplain so you're, you're sucking off the water before it comes down here. I mean, it's one thing to have access to floodplain down here, but we do not have the capacity in a major event. So the idea is to go upriver. I mean, that is part of what our Creating Resilient Communities group was trying to do is mm -hmm. so be supportive of projects up the river to suck off the water so you're taking the volume off the river in an event. And... Mm -hmm. um, so just to keep in mind, Kimberly and Chris, we, we would be interested to sign on to a regional MVP okay. that okay. would um, allow access to floodplains further up, so either on the, on the North River, even Clusson Brook. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, yeah. one of the brooks, um, I can't remember the brook that is um, the one in Holly. Oh, the Chickley. Chickley. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know why. That was in the newspaper for years and years and years. But the Chickley, they've now fixed it so it has access to the floodplain again because when they first did the, and they got in trouble, mm -hmm. it was channelized. So all that water was coming into the deer field at a high volume uh, and a high velocity. But now it, when they redid it, it had access to the floodplain. But I'm not sure if there's any protection on the floodplains up there in the Chickley. So it would, yeah. you know, even Holly, I don't know where they are on this, but. Um, yeah, Holly's not an MVP community. I think, um, well, Buckland is Ashfield, Conway, Buckland, Coleraine. So this, I think this idea we should um, work on and think about for FY21 because that's going to take a lot of coordination yeah. and discussions, but I think we should definitely keep that in mind and also looking if 
if we got a regional uh, scale MVP grant and you got a FEMA grant at the same time, they could match each other and just leverage more money. And this has been an idea that I've been um, Cause, wanting cause to do for years. Hazardous mitigation is federal. Yes. So yes. we could use federal money towards the state match. Yes. Um, Tom Curran, the Franklin um, Land Trust um, executive director, is ra raising private money mm -hmm. towards um, the access of the floodplain Great. kind of thing. So um, if we had some state money, mm -hmm. then our match, you know, maybe we wouldn't even have to match it because he yeah. would, he's trying to raise enough money so that we can. Um, and I had sent, uh, I know the, the problem is working with the state money on this is that they don't have very high value on floodplain, right. whereas the federal, um, <clears throat> I had just sent them an article that was in the, uh, Gosh, I can't even remember where it was, but it, it came up with the estimate. How do you value the yep. floodplain? Yep. Remember that? Yep. I, we had sent that. We had yeah. talked about that. So it came up to be like thirty-eight thousand. Um, right. Yeah. Um, an acre. So Tom was going to raise private money because the state, you know, looks like this. You know, basically says there's no value. So he yeah. was he was going to raise the difference so that we could could. Um, you know, a set aside conservation restrictions on that. So that would be, if that could count as a match, mm -hmm. even though it's we're not really participating, that would be fantastic. It would be great. And the um, I just finished up a project, and one of my partners was the Franklin Land Trust, and so we developed a river corridor easement. And this, it's still in draft form, but... Um, the EEA and other state agencies are really excited about it because it would um, compensate landowners for basically letting the river access its um, floodplain and its corridor. And it could be a standalone easement for a designated corridor, or it could be part of a larger conservation restriction um, if there's like upland portions of the watershed. So uh, the Franklin Land Trust it's, is very excited about this and I think they're going to be working in the future, like you said, Carolyn, to raise money and to look for landowners that are interested. And um, Tom both, has already committed to us. Yeah. So. And so, and the MVP will pay for uh, land conservation projects. Um, oh, and I wanted to say in terms of the valuation of the property within the river corridor easement, the land trust um, ha has done some work working with um, an appraisal firm, but more work needs to be done. We're thinking about multipliers and um, that would be kind of like a value added so that if your property was um, providing flood attenuation benefits to both the community where the property is as well as downstream communities there would be like a multiplier that would up the amount so this is that, all that, that was what the federal thing was yeah this is all yeah. like we're um we've made a lot of progress on this and so that's why i'm thinking you know next fiscal year and next round of grant funding we try to put together this bigger project and i think um Certainly, MEMA would be very, like, supportive and interested in it, and it would be kind of a first. I think, in other parts of the country, there, FEMA sees these larger scale regional projects, but here in New England, we just haven't um, done that, and we're kind of used to taking care of ourselves, right, in our own communities. So. Well, we would definitely be interested because we're at the bottom, so right. we want to be supportive of anything you can do upstream. So I think, yeah, I think that'll be something that we can definitely. work towards yeah, um, that sounds great. next year as well. So before, I, so thank you, Trevor, for um, marking up those sure. areas on on the map. Maybe Roger could. Roger, maybe you could look at the problem areas. Yeah. If you have some problem. Sure where, um, it, so I didn't mark it. it might be right where that legend is. 
It's a, it's the last house. Um, it's the last house next to UMass. <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll have to move the legend. <laughs> it's it's just be right next to the UMass farm. Right. Okay. Is Did, it under the legend? <laughs> Um, so, Chris, do you, I mean, I, I was anticipating us having the steering committee meeting to sort of. We're, we're going to need one more, yeah. Yeah, to, to sort of to, to, to kind flesh of get out. into some of the nitty gritty details right. of a few of the, the but, tasks. But, um, so, Kimberly, the main thing is Roger's here, so I want to make sure that you feel um, you got a handle on the. Um, whopping area, five and ten area, because um, we've I been mean, talking about it for yeah. I read months. Well, I mean, I read what's in the updated MVP report. Yeah, there's a pretty specific section on Whopping right. Road in there. Yeah. yeah. So, we so have that. I mean, I think I'm it's, all set, but a, I could. It's a complicated situation because there's two culverts that are right next to each other, uh -huh. um, and I don't know if we have we don't have a map of it in there, but um, I could. You know, Maybe we could talk some I, more I, I, about I it. I can explain it to you yeah. at some point. Um, there, so there's there's a whopping road culvert and there's a Route 5 culvert in there. They're almost right on top of one another and, mm -hmm. and they interact with each other. The problem you know. is the 5 and 10 culvert is state culvert right. and the whopping road one is our culvert. Right. So it has to be, to make it work, we have to work with the state on right. this. Yeah. And this, like circling back to the idea about looking at the larger drainage area, the larger kind of sub-watershed, if you will, because then you would say, you know, you'd be able to better make the argument that, um, okay, we don't control this, it's MassDOT's problem, but our, you know, engineering analysis Ma says MassDOT that would work with us, I think, because Roger can attest, we've had meetings for years. I mean, yeah. this has been like a... But I think, you know, the more information thing, you can give um, to MassDOT, the more helpful you can be, you're going to move, you know, move things along. And so using, if the, if the town feels that, um, Do you think if we put, what, do you think we should be encouraging, or we should ask Zach then, at, you know, Ty and Bond, mm -hmm. do, do we request that DOT put this, um, um, open bottom culvert as an up, upsize open bottom culvert? there on their project list because Absolutely. if we're doing all the work on this side so. and we're doing yeah. all the work on this side theirs is right. what's blocking well, what's what's all that what are all those plans up there is that part does that include whopping know. roadside of route five and ten or it's a different area oh. different area okay well, you're saying that the state should put an open body on well, those crossings well, what what we need to do is is check because uh, Zach is we hired Zach and he's done the engineering. He just doesn't have the application for the hazardous mitigation grant yet, but um, he's done the engineering, so he could tell us based on his engineering what volume of water is needs to move through there. So if it's undersized, then we can try to get Mass DOT as we're doing the work that they would put an open bo bottom upsized culvert there. But if it's the correct size, then just having them clean it out would be sufficient. So yeah, I, what we would need to do is just determine whether it, it, that we want them to put something new on their project list, or do we just ask them for better maintenance? Well, I think you'd have to figure out how much volume comes down. And just because it's open bottom did. doesn't mean it's going to flow anymore. No, no, no. But if, if you put an open bottom... Um, Upsize culvert, then more it will have well, more yeah, full yeah. flow. Increasing the volume, of the size of it, yes. But I think those culverts, like I said, when the state came in and dug the one out by Bittersweet and created a place for that silt to go, it opened that whole channel right up, and they maintained it for a little bit, and now it's off the boards and. It's so it was, so you think it's not being maintained, Roger? Is well, that correct? I mean, have they, you looked at well, it? Well, but it's. It isn't because it, it fills in because the silt right. travels down. So, so what we need to ask them, well, first we should ask Zach, do the calculations, is it big enough? But we should also then definitely encourage them to do more maintenance. Well, yeah, but it's, okay. it's I'll, I'll, if you I'll could call. clean out those two things to where the farmers clean their ditches out, 
that would solve the problem, but it's an ongoing thing, you know, when a, a tree comes down and Is it just silted dam. up, Roger, is it just silted up, or are they truly higher than what farmers have done on either side? Excuse me, Carolyn? Is it, is it just silted up, it, or is it when the farmers cleaned out their, their ditches? When the farmers the, cleaned it out, they probably cleaned out a lot of debris that naturally grew up, you know, brush will grow and stuff will fall in and then leaves catch on it and it builds a dam just like the beavers create a dam. And then the silt just keeps, where the water doesn't move, the silt will settle out and then it just fills it in. And it's, you've got to get it to the moving water, to the Deerfield River. And that's with any like little brook, you know, I, it has to like, we're talking I just, about I just didn't brook. know if, if, it, if it's too high no, Based I don't think it's too cleaning. high uh, okay. because I don't think that problem started till people didn't use all these little spots for pastures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Land was utilized different, you know, 50 or 80 years ago. Yeah, well, it's also definitely the flow of water's changed over there. Well, I know that's what you've been saying, but I've lived next to the Connecticut River, and when I was a kid, the water used to be much higher. And so I don't know if they put more flood control in or what, but I haven't seen the river. Last time I saw it really high was I think in 78 when we had some problems down at the wastewater treatment plant. That was the highest I've seen it, and I've never seen it that high again since then. Hurricane well, I, I guess I'm talking about Well, like that the was Deerfield more of the river. Deerfield River. Yeah. Than I know, but ours, the Connecticut, the Connecticut pretty... didn't really raise that much. When no. that was flooding, the river by the Connecticut, there wasn't an impact at all. You don't see the um, re the re releases the releases impact the Connecticut further up, like in you know the Gill Northfield area. Yeah. Um, Gray Hydro, as far as I can tell, have more releases per week than um, Trans Canada does, but I I haven't been monitoring as as closely as I should, so I can't tell if there's additional erosion happening because. You're having like 20, 40 year storm events with each release. So if you have multiple releases mm -hmm. over a week, you're having as if you're having 20, 40 year storms. You know, Why are they times releasing a... this water, Carolyn? To generate power or? Yeah, generate really? power. Really? They release that much water? Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems when you have erosion on the riverbanks. The riverbanks aren't meant to have well, the, I, the I artificial know there was some releases. Concern with just with the local hydro. Hmm. It's, it, the Connecticut River is further up from us. We don't, we don't have really the impacts of the releases. And I don't, I don't know if how it's mitigated, whether it's mitigated over in Montague or what the deal is. But you don't see it down here on the Connecticut. But we have a lot more issues on the Deerfield since um, change of ownership. But I haven't. I haven't even documented that or started to document that. So once this culvert's put in, this Mill Village culvert, when will they start to try to clean out any of, like from, say, Mill Village on both of those drainage areas out to 5 and 10? When would there any work be done on those two? Well, we don't have any funding for that work, but the Mill Village culvert will go in um, next spring. And it'll be interesting to see, actually, you know, if that really changes the flow of, of that brook. It's an unnamed brook. Um, it, it may, because it's so backed up by the collapsed Mill Village culvert, it may, you know, even clean itself out just because well, the flow will increase. It will um, to a certain degree. That temporary culvert that was put in was placed too high, and that's backing up some water. So that's yeah, why I say yeah. they really need to find out what the grade of that. Yeah. Five and ten one is for both of them, yeah. and figure out where they need to put it. And if it was undersized, I don't. I'm not that familiar with. Well, those. we're uh, that's definitely number one on our list is to contact Zach at Tie and Bond and have him look at that. Chris, we'll have to because yeah. we we certainly don't want to put in the Mill Village culvert and then have issues. I'm, I'm really confident he's got that yeah, under control. I know but I, he knows it's a problem. We've it tomorrow, but I. Want to make sure we do yeah. really confirm well, it. It's as simple as just going up that thing and start where that culvert is, and just pull a branch out here and a branch out there, and the water starts to increase the flow, and it'll clean itself out, and then that land would be more workable to try to get into shape to put it back into farm. That's land. also um, habitat for um, 
the mosquitoes that carry West Nile disease. We've, we've um, mm -hmm. uh, trapped West Nile mosquitoes there for several years in a row. So that, that is targeted um, when we get going with the mosquito district. So that well, you know how they have these cleanups uh, for trash on rivers and stuff? Why don't you create a clean, a clean up for brush and leaves and stuff out of the brooks? Well, uh, Roger, you'll probably make friends with this, our new superintendent as soon as he starts. Because he's, he's very enthusiastic, he's really nice, and um, he knows this, this is a target area already. So, But that was one of the reasons that um, we've been able to you know, we wanted the Mosquito District so we could identify habitats. And as a public health reason, attack some of the ditch cleaning and stuff like that. Because there's behind, um, at the base of the mountain, along our streets, a lot of the ditches haven't been maintained and they retain water and um, there's no flow. Right, Chris? And, and so, um, I mean, we've had several residents complain about it over the years. So mm -hmm. it's... The whole system should be looked at. Um, so that's actually a good idea to get um, more professional advice. That would be lend, lend credence to our ability to clean it out. Mm -hmm. I think. So, um, is there anything else that anyone wants to talk about, um, Chrissy? You, you didn't really have too many comments. Are you? No, I'm, I'm learning as much. As oh, okay. Well, it's very interesting, actually. I, and water is fascinating. I, I <laughs> we go to a lot of meetings about water, <laughs> but I, I have learned a lot over the years on how rivers move and how you and you and you and from my initial mistake dumping rock in 2005 October it's coming up. This is I was traumatized in October um, Columbus Day weekend 2005. Um, we had a huge. Four and a half million dollars worth of damage, and Uncle Storm Tammy. Yeah, and we dumped rock on Millville on uh, Mill Village Road, right by Child's Cross Road, and um, that was a mistake. And I've learned so much since then. So, um, but thankfully we were not penalized, and I will always be so thankful to that um, uh, civil um, uh, this um, civil corps guy. Oh man. He's in the civil, um, silver jackets now, but he was yeah. really, he was so nice. Um, but I learned so much, and that's why I will never be in that position again. We, uh, we just really had some terrible times back then. And, um, but the state is much more responsive. We, MEMA is a much different situation. Mitt Romney was down in South Carolina making jokes about tax Massachusetts and we couldn't get anybody from the governor's office to come up and visit. And we've really come a long ways. And I have a book of everybody's phone numbers, so I will know who to call from now on. <laughs> so anyway, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, Roger, I really pr appreciate you coming so that we can thank document. Thank you very much for your efforts to try to help us We out. really are trying to do the Wapping Road area, I swear, Roger. I really am trying. And Chris, thank you for coming. I, I really appreciate you um, having interest. This is three nights in a row that I've yes. seen you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if anybody, if you would please just take a few minutes to look at the maps and make sure. Yep, um, we're commenting. Yeah. And um, anybody that is watching that wants to submit comments, please um, submit them to our office, Slickman's office and we'll pass them on to Chris and our working group for the MVP program, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, and um, the Hazards Mitigation Update um, Plan. And I just want to thank both um, Kimberly and Chris for working together so that we really actually have a viable, true, hazardous, meaningful, meaningful um, hazards mitigation plan and um, really uh, flexible, up-to-date MVP program because um, this is the second time that we've updated our MVP um, plan in just the short time that we've been certified. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons the state keeps funding us is because um, they're seeing that we're making it to be a true plan. Yeah. And I, I 
I think they appreciate that. Plus, they have to they have to put money out in the western part of the state. They can't take it all in the coastal communities, and so we're the poster child. So we want to continue. It's a good to place to be. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Have a nice night, everybody. Thank you.